Good morning. Good morning. So I want to um, take this lecture and the next lecture to start talking about, to talk about Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is a little bit more diffuse than Chapter 7 in that it's basically introducing you to multi-step synthesis, which you've already gotten some of in Chapter 7. What I'm going to do is talk about sort of strategies in synthetic organic chemistry. I think this lecture I want to talk about the concept of umpalung dipole inversion. Let me write that out. It's a concept that was introduced by Zeebach in the 1970s. It's a German word, hence the, uh, the strange pronunciation. And I'll show you, I'll take this through some examples. I want to give us kind of three different ideas with this. I want to talk about the benzoin condensation, which is a reaction that's sort of the genesis of the idea. It's a very nice reaction. I'll take you to the idea of acyl anion equivalents and their use in organic synthesis. And then what I'll do is I want to show you the acyloin condensation, another very old reaction, and we'll take a look at a couple of examples. I have tried to parallel ideas that you see in the textbook because I know the textbook has a lot of content. So we've been talking a lot about carbonyl chemistry, particularly in Chapter 7, and saying there are so many natural disconnections in molecules. We've talked about the aldol reaction. We've talked about the Michael addition reaction. We've talked about various other, other reactions that all involve natural condensation chemistry, Claisen condensation, and so forth. And let me show you what I mean. All right, so for example, we have now, I hope, learned to look and say, oh yeah, when I see a 1,3 dicarbonyl, I understand that this molecule can come from the reaction of an enolate with an ester, that it can come from a Claisen condensation. It makes use of the natural propensity of the alpha position of a carbonyl to be nucleophilic and the propensity of the carbonyl to be electrophilic. If you look at a 1,5 dicarbonyl, you might recognize that this could come from the conjugate addition of the Michael addition of an enolate to an alpha beta unsaturated dicarbonyl compound. Again, the natural propensity of the beta position of an alpha beta and saturated carbonyl compound to be electrophilic and the natural propensity of the alpha position in the enolate to be nuclear of a carbonyl compound and the enolate to be nucleophilic. And so similarly, if you look at a beta hydroxy carbonyl, That should scream to you aldol reaction. In other words, the natural propensity of, again, an alpha position to be nucleophilic and a carbonyl to be electrophilic. And ditto if we look at an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. The same basic idea, aldol reaction with dehydration. But if we arrange our functional groups differently, if we look at a 1,2 dicarbonyl, now things are a little bit more complicated. We don't see an obvious disconnection. We don't see an obvious way to put that molecule together based on natural propensities of a carbonyl group to be electrophilic. In short, if I wanted to imagine forming this bond, I'd be a little bit stymied because I'd be connecting an electrophilic carbonyl with an electrophilic carbonyl. And we kind of have the same problem 
for a 1,4 dicarbonyl, if you're looking and trying to connect the center bond, you might be a little bit stymied in the sense you'd say, well, that would be sort of a nucleophile, an enolate with an enolate, that might be problematic. Or if I tried to form this bond to the carbonyl here, you'd say, well, the carbonyl is electrophilic. If I imagined an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl over here, I'd be connecting an electrophile with an electrophile. And you'd come up with the same, same sorts of problems just to give you one other example for an alpha hydroxy carbonyl. And so this is sort of the antithesis of the Aldol, Claisen, Michael, Manic chemistry that we were talking about previously that all seemed to fit together. So I want to talk to you now about the idea of this inversion of nucleophilicity. And I want to start by proposing the idea of an acyl anion equivalent. Of course, I'm not the one to propose it. This concept goes back a long, long time. The reaction that I'm about to show you, the benzoin condensation, has been known since the 19th century. Although the idea of an acyl anion equivalent and the idea of umpalong inverting natural polarity really comes about in the 20th century and really in the 1970s, for example, as I said with Zabach. All right, so the basic idea of a benzoin condensation is that we're going to have some type of ace, well, the basic idea here in acyl anion chemistry is we're going to have some acyl anion equivalent and we're going to have some type of carbonyl compound. And you could easily imagine now a reaction that could go ahead and go and do this. At least this is the concept, but not the practice. And you can see the obvious problem in the practice. If I imagine somehow generating an anion next to a carbonyl, you'd say, well, that's a problem. I can't just like pull a proton off of an aldehyde. The aldehyde is going to self-condense. In fact, the beta position or the alpha position is more acidic. So one has to do something in order to achieve this. Well, as I said, the benzoin condensation really provides an example of the concept. And so the benzoin condensation is as follows. If you take an aromatic aldehyde, and it really has to be aromatic, it really can't be al aliphatic, and you treat it with catalytic potassium cyanide or sodium cyanide, it doesn't matter, cyanide is, is cyanide, if you treat it with a catalytic amount of potassium cyanide, you get a coupling of two molecules together like so, getting to an alpha hydroxy carbonyl. The reaction gets its name from the molecule benzoin. So if you take benzaldehyde and you treat it with these conditions, you get the molecule that's name is benzoin, had a name even before people knew the structure of it. And just to show you operationally how well this reaction works, this is bucket chemistry. A lot of the 19th century chemistry worked very well because you could basically run it in a bucket, forget air sensitive, forget a whole lot. You could go ahead and mix chemicals together. 
One of my favorite sources that I like to refer to for examples is Orgsin. You may have seen Orgsin in some of the homework problems. Orgsin was initially written really to allow chemists, there weren't many chemicals available, and so starting with very simple molecules like benzaldehyde, you could make the chemicals that you needed. So initially it started as primarily as preparations. As it developed, it became a showcase for lots of organic chemistry, and you'll find very good chemistry in there because it's all been checked, it's all been selected to be important and checked by other people. So Orgsin comes out with annual volumes. The annual volumes get collected into collective volumes. So this one happens to be, you would find the reference in an annual volume, but it's also in collective volume one page 94. If you go to the Orgsin website, you'll notice on the website that there are two pull-down menus because you can have either the annual volume cited or the collected volume cited, collective volume cited. So anyway, collective volume one is relatively old, first half of the 19th century. The particular procedure they give there involves taking 500 grams of benzaldehyde, 50 grams of potassium cyanide, that's a lot, it's a dangerous amount of it, potassium cyanide is very poisonous, going ahead and cooking it up in ethanol water, and what you get out is a whoppingly good yield of the molecule benzoin. In this procedure, they get out 450 to 460 grams, which is a 90 to 92 percent yield. All right, let's take a look at how this reaction works. So the mechanism, this is probably one of the earliest cases where chemists were able to propose a reasonable mechanism for the reaction. The mechanism for the reaction was proposed by Lapworth in 1903. And the mechanism involves the very special property of cyanide anion, or of cyanide, and that is that cyanide in, can form a cyanohydrin, and the nitrile group can stabilize a negative charge. So if you take benzaldehyde and simply treat it with hydrogen cyanide, you get the cyanohydrin, you get the hydroxy compound. If you stick to the anion conditions, in other words, not hydrogen cyanide, but the basic conditions of potassium cyanide, then you end up with reversible addition of the cyanide to the benzaldehyde to get the cyanohydrin anion. Now we've talked about the cyano group. We said that we bucket listed or bucket hold sort of the cyano group in the carboxylic acid family. It's the same family as carboxylic acids. And we said that acids and esters and nitriles all have an amides, all have acidic alpha protons and the pKa of that alpha proton is about 25. Now, with the extra stabilization of the benzene ring here, and if we forget about this negative charge, this proton's going to be a little bit more acidic than that, so instead of 25, somewhere lower, maybe toward 20. So you can write an equilibrium between the oxyanion and the carbanion. and more than you can write it, that equilibrium exists. That carbanion is stabilized by delocalization into the cyano group. If you want to write a resonance structure, you can. You could go ahead just like you do with an enolate 
and write a resonance structure like so, I think it's easier in this case just to think about the carbanion resonance structure. Anyway, the carbanion is nucleophilic on carbon. So if you have an equilibrium concentration of the carbanion, and you do have an equilibrium concentration of the carbanion, and you have your benzaldehyde, the carbanion can attack, and the overall result then is carbon-carbon bond formation like so. Now, we're in aqueous solution or aqueous ethanol solution. Protons can go on, protons can go off. The proton on the hydroxy group that's beta to the cyano, or that's, that's, uh, that's next to the cyano group is even more acidic, so we have an equilibrium in all of these reactions here. Really. And just as the cyanohydrin formation or the cyanohydrin anion formation is an equilibrium, the breakdown is an equilibrium. In other words, your oxygen can kick back electrons and kick out cyanide. And as you can see by the yield on the other blackboard, this reaction proceeds quite well. Thoughts or questions? So whenever, I think whenever nature presents something then, and it's useful, organic chemists want to exploit it, want to be able to build upon that. And I've already mentioned the name Gilbert Stork. Gilbert Stork really was one of the great synthetic organic chemists of the early part of the second half of the 20th century. Gilbert Stork, we already saw his chemistry with enamines. Gilbert Stork also was taken with the cyanohydrin reaction and wanted to exploit this to be able to control it and use it to build up bonds. So here in the case of the, uh, the benzoin condensation, we've got some limitations. We're always talking about self-condensation. It would be hard to control the reaction and say have benzaldehyde react with tolualdehyde unless there are very special circumstances. So just as I made this big pitch for how nice the directed aldol is, the LDA aldol, because you have this element of control versus just cooking everything up in, si in sodium hydroxide. Very similarly, you can get this element of control if you can take charge of the reaction. You also can modulate the base. So Stork developed O-protected cyanohydrins. As acyl anion equivalents.
and I'll show you the basic idea. The basic idea is now we're going to have some aldehyde. It doesn't need to be aromatic. And we will go ahead and convert it to the corresponding protected cyanohydrin. I will write OR prime here for a moment just to show you the idea. Now you can go ahead and use a base, base like LDA, for example, and then react the resulting anion with an electrophile. And this is all concept here right now. I'm not showing you the specific reagent, so I'm just going to say E plus to mean an electrophile. That's going to result in reaction of the carbon to form a bond. And now, if we carry out a hydrolysis, right, if you can cleave off your group on your R prime group here, if you carry out a hydrolysis, then you can get back to the cyanohydrin, and ultimately the cyanohydrin breaks down to the carbonyl. Let me give you a specific example. So let's take the molecule acetaldehyde and let us say we want to go ahead and react, right? Of course, this is if you want me to write it out. I shouldn't have to at this point. This is like so. If we want to go ahead and make this position nucleophilic, let me show you the sequence of steps that Gilbert Stork developed. So if you treat an aldehyde with hydrogen cyanide, so now cyanide anion goes under basic conditions and adds reversibly, forms, forms the anion, the oxyanion reversibly. But if we do this in acid, if you do this with potassium cyanide and uh, sulfuric acid, so you have hydrogen cyanide, then you can isolate the cyanohydrin. Do this in a good fume hood if you do, because you will expose yourself to, to lethal cyanide if you don't. Okay, so you can isolate the cyanohydrin. What Gilbert Stork then does was introduce a protecting group onto oxygen, onto the OH group, because he's going to want to directly, deliberately pull this proton off. So one protecting group that you can use, the one that he used, is the ethoxyethyl group. So if you take ethyl vinyl ether and some catalytic acid, I'll write this as cat H plus, you can picture what happens. You protonate at the, be uh, at the beta position, you protonate here, you generate a carbocation over here, stabilized by the oxygen. Your OH group is nucleophilic, and the overall result is that you get the ethoxyethyl group.
All right, so that is a common protecting group. It's very much akin to, who's heard of the THP protecting group in synthetic chemistry? It's very much akin to the THP protecting group. In the THP protecting group, you use dihydropyran. Same basic idea. Okay, so you've got this acid labile protecting group. I'll just write this as ethoxyethyl or EE. You have the protected cyanohydrin. You treat with LDA. And I want to give us a concrete example. Let's take cyclohexenone as our example. And I'll just write H2O workup to show that we're doing an aqueous workup. And the overall product of this reaction now is a conjugate addition. So, and upon treatment with aqueous acid like HCl and water, we hydrolyze the acetal of the ethoxyethyl group. The cyanohydrin breaks down, and the overall result is that you get this compound. So this is a 1,4-dicarbonyl compound. It is the effective procedure of essentially pulling off the alpha, pulling off the aldehyde proton of acid aldehyde, doing a conjugate addition, a Michael addition, to, alpha, to the alpha beta unsaturated ketone, to cyclohexenone, to give us the 1,4 dicarbonyl, except without these types of machinations, there's no way that we could actually achieve this. Thoughts? Yeah. Um, do we have to use like unsaturated ginger to make that, or could you use like a silo type of ginger? Could you use a oh, could you use a silo mm -hmm. protecting? Absolutely. There would be many other variants that are possible and many variants of you know of acyl anion chemistry have been developed. In fact, it's sort of sort of was the beginning of this movement of umpalung that really got people thinking in the, in the 70s and into the early 80s as different laboratories tried to develop their own flavors of reagents. So yeah, absolutely, there are other variants. I don't know off the top of my head whether the TMS cyanohydrin would work in this chemistry or whether it would break apart. Chances are it would be fine, and in fact, TMS cyanide is a reagent that you can buy, and so it wasn't developed well at the time of Gilbert Stork, but chances are, yeah, that would work just fine. Other thoughts and questions? I don't want to drown you under, under different chemistry, but I want to come back to one, one example. Since I said that Sabach really developed this idea, I want to show the example that he developed with Corey, and that was 
dithionines as acyl anion, whoops, thiane. as a anion equivalents. It's the same basic idea. We're going to come up with a way of stabilizing a negative charge at a position of something that was once a carbonyl and has the potential to become a carbonyl again, just as we did with the aldehyde through the cyanohydrin and then back hydrolyzing it. And so the basic idea here is you have an aldehyde, you go ahead, you convert it to the 1,3-dithiane So this dithiane is just the dithioacetal. You've seen acetals before. Sulfur is right below oxygen in the periodic table. You've seen that if you take a, one, a diol and react it with an aldehyde under dehydration, dehydrating conditions, you can generate an acetal. If you take a dithiane, a di, di, if you take a compound with, with two uh, thiol, thiol groups in it, react it with an aldehyde under dehydrating conditions, you can generate the dithiane. Sulfur is special. So sulfur is, as you move down the periodic table, your elements get bigger, they're more polarizable, which means they're better at stabilizing charge nearby, or particularly stabilizing negative charge by polarizing. So once you go ahead and you you put the sulfurs here. This proton now, instead of being like an alkane, is reasonably acidic. It can be removed with LDA, so it's more acidic than diisopropylamine, which is pKa of uh, about 36. So if you treat this with LDA, or you can use butyl lithium, and then you go ahead and, I'm sorry, you do use it's more acidic than, I take it back, it's more acidic than an alkalith, than a regular uh, alkane. If you treat it with butyl lithium and then treat with an electrophile, we'll call that E plus. Now, you can react the electrophile. And then if you again subject this to hydrolysis, Now you've gone and formed your bond. E, not, not, not ET, not necessarily ET. All right, so that's the basic idea. You're going to hide your, your carbonyl as the 1,3-dithiane. You'll be able to metallate. You'll then be able to react with an electrophile. You'll then hydrolyze your dithiane. In practice, the acids that are often used for making thioacetals and breaking apart thioacetals are often a little bit different than the acids you'd use for the oxygen analogs. So I'll give you one particular example. This is one that came from uh, Corey and Zabach and Jacks in 1975. We'll again start with acetaldehyde, just like the Stork example. We'll take the 1,3-propane dithiol, and we need some acid. BF3 etherate is a Lewis acid. That's one acid that could be used. Or zinc chloride is another Lewis acid that could be used. Basically, all of these acids are doing the same thing as you would do with, say, H+. Plus you're basically binding to the oxygen, making it more electrophilic. The sulfur's attacking, you're shifting some protons around, you're losing water, you're having another sulfur come in. The overall result is that you get the thioacetal.
And now for this particular example, we'll go ahead and treat with butyl lithium in THF. And I'm going to treat with cyclohexanone here, cyclohexenone here, just to show you a little bit of a contrast here. So the lithium at this position is a little bit harder. It's a little bit less, uh, more localized and less delocalized. So as, whereas this acyl anion equivalent does a 1,4 addition, this acyl anion equivalent does a 1,2 addition. And the result after aqueous workup is like so. <clears throat> now, thioacetals are a pain in the neck to hydrolyze. If we had the oxygen analog, you could just hydrolyze with aqueous acid. You probably could beat, beat on this really strong with aqueous acid, it would hydrolyze. You'd probably make a lot of mischief over here, generating carbocations, protonating, protonating this oxygen, generating a carbocation. The acid that's used for sulfur, well, sort of an acid, mercury, sulfur loves mercury, mercury too. And so if you want to go ahead and hydrolyze a dithiane, mercury, uh, HG2, mercuric salts work very well. So the conditions that are used here are mercuric chloride in water, calcium carbonate as a buffer, CaCO3 chalk in water. The overall result basically is your mercury binds on to the sulfur, your water you protonate, you form a carbocation, your water attacks, the mercury binds on to the other sulfur. Once mercury binds on to sulfur, it doesn't let go. And so you've hy you hydrolyze and you get over there. As you can see, in both, of these, in both of these conditions, we get to play with some real nasties. In the case of the cyanohydrins, we're playing with hydrogen cyanide, really toxic. In the case of the thioacetals, you're playing with mercury, really toxic, but such is the nature of chemistry sometimes. Thoughts or questions? So, why, why does that one attack at the two positions? Uh, it's more basic, it's harder. So in general, yeah, in general, I kind of like to think about, I don't know, cut off sort of somewhere in the 20s for, if you have equilibrating conditions, in general, you can get Michael addition. If you have a base that's not too basic, you'll get Michael addition, unless you're very sterically hindered at the beta position. If you're more basic, you tend to get 1-2 addition. It's a little bit of a gray area, but apparently the pKa differences and reversibilities are enough that in the case, the cyanohydrin case, your pKa is it's a lot more acidic, the proton, and so it does go 1-4. Other thoughts, other questions? All right, there are a ton of acyl anion equivalents I could show you, and I think I just wanted to give you a taste. I want to give you one, one other example. Since we're talking about 1, 2, and 1, 4 relationships, I just want to give you one other example that kind of, kind of puts things into perspective here. I think this comes from the homework problems, although I'm not sure it's one that I one that I assigned, 
there are plenty of cases where you can have the equivalent of an electrophile alpha to a carbonyl, either with the carbonyl masked or with a suitable carbonyl compound. And that also allows this idea of umpalung. That also allows this idea of inversion of polarity. So a very pedestrian example that I can show you here is, okay, if we take this cyclohexenone and we treat it with LDA and THF and then we treat it with methyl bromoacetate So LDA and THF generates the kinetic enolate. Methyl bromoacetate is electrophilic at the alpha position. And the overall result is that we've generated a 1,4-dicarbonyl. And your methyl bromoacetate has effectively acted as an electrophile at the alpha position. All right, I want to conclude our discussion of Umpalung by talking about the acyloin condensation. And so in the acyloin condensation, this is another very old reaction that goes back to the 19th century. So acyloin is this molecule here. I guess if we wanted to name it, it would be 3-hydroxy-2-butanone. Acyloin comes from reaction of ethyl, of ethyl acetate with sodium metal followed by aqueous workup. In general, the acyloin condensation works as follows. You have some sort of ester. You treat it with sodium metal. It's going to take four equivalents of sodium metal. And the, I'll write four equivalents. And the overall result is after workup you get the alpha hydroxy carbonyl compound. Now, if you first looked at your notes and you said, wait a second, this is exactly the idea that we did at the beginning when we talked about the benzoin condensation. You'd say, oh wait, we had two molecules of benzaldehyde and they condensed to an alpha hydroxy carbonyl compound. But something different is going on here. So think about the whole concept I talked about with oxidation state. In the case of benzaldehyde, we're going from an aldehyde, or more specifically, two aldehydes, to an alpha hydroxy carbonyl. At no point do we change oxidation state 
in that chemistry. But in this case, we're going from an ester. An ester is automatically too higher in oxidation state than an aldehyde, right? I've talked about oxidation state and synthesis. We're going from an ester to an alpha hydroxy carbonyl. So there is a reductive process. Sodium has an electron. We're going ahead, we're using four molecules of sodium. We're pumping four electrons into the system. Effectively, we are reducing both esters down to the aldehyde oxidation state, down to oxidation state units. All right, so how does this go? Let's take a look at a specific example. And the example I'll give here, again, I'm going to borrow from org sin, and then I'll show you how this reaction works. So this is org sin, volume 2, page 114. And the example that they do over here is they take ethyl butyrate, they treat it with sodium metal, and two, they carry out an aqueous workup. and they go to this uh, hydroxy, um, four hydro five hydroxy, four octanone. All right, let's take a look at how this reaction occurs. So you go ahead, you kick an electron, you add an electron into this system. You carry out a reduction. One electron gets you to a ketal anion, to a ketal radical. <coughs> and now two of these Radicals have a tendency to self-condense, have a tendency to form a bond. Two of these ketal radicals come together like so. to form a carbon-carbon bond. But at this point, you've got a tetrahedral intermediate. You've got an unstable species. We know what tetrahedral intermediates do. They break down, right? The electrons kick back. You, you know this from ester hydrolysis. The electrons kick back, same down here. We lose two ethoxides. That gets us to the 1,2 dicarbonyl. But the 1,2 dicarbonyl is now, we've got sodium metal present. The 1,2 dicarbonyl goes ahead and picks up electrons, you again reduce it. I'll just write plus E minus twice. That takes you over to the enolate. Pump two electrons into the system, you get the dianion. Just picture, picture going ahead adding an electron here, adding an electron here. You could almost think of it as again forming a radical here, and of course those two electrons pair up. And now on aqueous workup, you go to the enol 
which then tautomerizes to the ketone. All right, I just want to conclude by showing you a couple of cool preparative examples of the acyloin condensation in a couple of, couple of intramolecular reactions. So the acyloin condensation can form rings big and small. And I'll take two more examples from org sin. Org sin collective volume 4840. And the molecule that I'll take is the 10 carbon diacid ester. And if we treat this with sodium and xylene, xylene's a solvent that has a boiling point above the melting point of sodium, so you can stir up your sodium and make a fine-grained powder, what's often called sodium sand. And then you go ahead, it cyclizes, and you go ahead and you carry out aqueous workup, and the overall result is that you get the 10-membered ring compound, which I will just write like so. And I'll give you one more example from Org Sin. This one comes from Org Sin Collective Volume 6 page 167, and we'll take succinic acid, or more specifically, diethyl succinate, the diethyl ester of succinic acid, and slightly modified conditions, sodium in TMS chloride with TMS chloride in toluene, that traps us over to you trap the dianion, and that takes us over to the cyclobutane. The TMS enol ethers are very prone to hydrolysis, and even just stirring with methanol hydrolyzes the TMS enol ethers. You hydrolyze off MEO TMS, I'll say minus MEO TMS. And the overall result is you have 2-hydroxycyclobutanone. All right, well, I think that's probably all that I wanted to say about this type of umpalung chemistry, but basically we've seen all of those cases I started with at the beginning of class, all these unnatural cases being accessed where now we're doing one, what, we're forming a 1-4 relationship or a 1-2 relationship. I think what I'll do is pick up probably talking about retrosynthetic analysis on Wednesday. See you then.